Now, there are multiple thank yous that go with this. Oh, by the way, I'm Michael Hall. <laughs> I have the honor to be the president of the Rye Aspect Chapter, and I am pleased to be the program director of the MPA and the MSN Leadership Programs. Uh, but none of, a, none of the program activity nor the RIASPA events could take place without the help of significant people. Among them are Jane Flora. The, the email you got with the nifty uh, electronic flyer, that's Mrs. Flora. We sat down and I gave her sort of a general idea, what I thought ought to be on there, and she took that and executed it, and I tell you what, when she showed it to me, my socks were not done. She's first rate. She will be doing the artwork for our May 1 to, uh, event also. Pay no attention to the men. <laughs> <laughs> um, in addition, there are people to thank who were on the Rye Aspa Council, some of whom are here tonight. Erin Chesky. Linda uh, Almonte, who unfortunately is ill. Uh, Sarah Robertson, where are you, Ms. Robertson? There she is. Uh, Tom Manick. Uh, Steve Manick. Where are you, Steve? There you are. Have I left anyone out, Mrs. Flores? I, sh I feel that I am, but without, without the help of those folks, None of it. You wouldn't be looking at food. We wouldn't be in the room, um, and we'd be in class. <laughs> okay, we will be in class. <laughs> Seven thirty. Now, um, we also have some other important people to recognize. The, um, the American Society for Public Administration annual conference was held this past week. And I was in attendance there, along with the leaders of the Public Administration Academy of the Pawtucket High Schools. Um, the PA Academy is a fairly unique approach to education. Um, the model for the PA approach, the PA Academy approach, is the one in Pawtucket High School at Tobin and Shea. <coughs> And the United States Department of Education has recognized that model and has it on their website. Now, the PA Academy has been selective in its membership. You don't get in simply because you apply and you happen to be a student. You are screened, and it's a fairly rigorous screening. And then you have to take specialized courses, and you, in fact, have to listen to me at one point or another during the course of the school. The funding that is available for such efforts, as you probably aware, has been significantly reduced as a result of all those things going on in Washington. And the money has been more difficult to get. And one of the reasons that the money is more difficult to get now is that the the Department of Education has now required that there are four criteria that have to be met in order to get that funding. And if you don't have those four, you don't get any money. Now, the PA Academy up to this point has met all, all three of them. And the reason that the fourth one wasn't met is that there was no such thing. The fourth criterion is that you must have certification from the, an industry trade group um, for the field. And there is an industry trade group and certification in engineering and marketing and fashion design, all of which have academies also. But there hasn't been one in PA until Friday last. Um, Michael Connolly, Ed Koska, who is right here, and I met with the outgoing and the incoming presidents of um, the American Society for Public Administration at the conference. We made our case to them that it was vital that ASPA support us and provide certification. I can report tonight 
that that meeting was successful, and that we have a letter that is going forward to the uh, ASPA Council, has to be approved by them, of course, um, but I'm told that that's going to be successfully approved, and we will be the only public administration academy in the United States of America with a certification. That is due primarily to the hard work of Michael Connolly and Ed Costa. Gentlemen. Uh, earlier the, today, or earlier this evening, I thought I saw one of your students. Where's Mr. Tolton? Mr. Souza is also here. I forgot to mention Mr. Souza. I knew I was. Please forgive me. Mr. Souza is at Tolman High School running the academy program there. Um, what happened to the student? Where is it? Over there, the there he is. Stand <laughs> and uh, This gentleman is named, I forget, I'm sorry, Tyrone. Tyrone. Thank you, Tyrone. Tyrone is in the <laughs> CJ Academy. We are you. <laughs> they didn't tell me you guys. Uh, stand up and be ready. Thank you very much. Carly, are you have a last name? Nash. Carly Nash and? Very, very good. <laughs> well, I get kudos for remembering my name. <laughs> I'm going to write it down so I can remember it. Thank you for coming, ladies. And you're in the CJ Academy or the BA Academy? The BA Academy. Excellent. There you go. You're, a, you're, you're the only student that has a certification in public administration in the United States. Thank you, ladies. Thank all of you for coming. Uh, also joining us tonight is uh, Dennis Litke. Uh, Mr. Litke is with the... Um, upward bound, I'm sorry, not upward bound. College upward bound. Close. Right. Because uh, yeah. they're upward bound anyway, right? Um, and is working closely with Roger Williams on that program, and we're pleased to have him here this evening. Thank you for joining us. Also with us tonight is Dean John Stout. Dean Stout. Uh, Dean Stout is the long serving Dean of School of Continuing Studies and is largely responsible for PA being at Roger Williams University. We also have uh, Bob Robertson, who is the Dean of Graduate and Continuing Studies. Dave Robertson, thank you for coming. All right, and thank everybody here in the audience for coming. Um, our um, featured speaker this evening is Saul Kaplan. Now, I don't know if you've seen or heard Mr. Kaplan before, uh, but I think you're going to be pleased to hear what he has to say. Now, I asked him to be here this evening, and I just talked to him a little while ago and said, here's your agenda, and he said, I only have 15 minutes. <coughs> and you guys know how I do times. <laughs> um, and he said, despite needing a week, he would stick to 15 minutes. Because what I want to happen is for you folks to ask important questions, and he is the man to ask them. I was making a long drive on the Mass Pike, I believe late November, early December. You'll have to recall for me, Mr. Kaplan, but I was listening to the only NPR station I could get at the time, and it was uh, WBUR. Um, no. No, no. No, no. It was WBGH. That's what it was, because that's Radio Boston, right? And I'm, I'm listening to this panel discussion about New England. And there were three panelists, and Mr. Ka Kaplan was one of them. Two of those panelists were talking about how New England, and I assume they meant all the way from Maine down to uh, the New York state line with Connecticut, uh, were less than innovative. I don't think they actually used the word hidebound, but I think not open to change and so on. And then the moderator turned to Mr. Kaplan and said, Saul, how do you see it? And of course, it was 180 degrees difference. And I thought, this guy, is he's on to something. He's tapped into a vein of um, thinking that I like, and I bet my students would like. And so I believe at some point when I ran out of WBGX, uh, PGH signal, I called Mrs. Floor on the cell phone and said, look this guy up. And she went immediately to the website. And I said, read it to me. So I'm driving at 70 miles an hour on cruise control. And Mrs. Floor is telling me what's on the website. I said, we must invite this man to 
to our March 7th event. Now, there are three events we're holding this year. One was in October on the 26th, today, and the last one of the year will be May 7th, or May 1. Where did I get 7th? May 7th, May 1. I didn't get it. <laughs> Now, the theme that we started with, and I thank Dr. Manick and the rest of the uh, Rhode Island uh, uh, ASPA chapter for coming up with this theme, was about learning, innovation, and knowledge. And so the theme is going to be carried on tonight with that same kind of idea. In October, we had the Knowledge District panel, and we had members of uh, the State Planning uh, Office. We had the RIDEC uh, person. We had... Um, Chamber of Commerce, and we had, uh, I forget the fourth one. Who was it? Well, we had four. And it was quite good, and I thought we asked very important questions, and uh, we may have even discovered some uh, new areas that hadn't been thought about in the knowledge history. So tonight we carry on that theme, and May 1, will be on the Bristol campus, actually Portsmouth, at the Bay Point facility. You are all invited. Uh, registration at 8.30, um, and we will have breakfast and coffee and so on. We have two, count them two, Blockbuster innovators, both of whom are women. Uh, we have the provost of the Naval War College coming, and we have C. Nicole Mason from NYU, who is the uh, woman who's begun the National Women's Network. So I, that's fairly innovative. So we're going to be able to have more learning, more innovation. Please come consider coming to that event. Mrs. Moore will be sending out yet more exciting artwork. Now, if you've had a chance to go on to uh, the Business Innovation Factory website, you've seen a number of things there that point to what I think Mr. Kaplan was talking about that Thursday afternoon that I heard him on the radio. So Mr. Kaplan? If you would care to come forward and take the microphone, we will begin your 15 minutes. Thank you, uh, Michael. Thank you, uh, everybody, for, for being here tonight. Um, uh, I think I understand the, tonight's topic, uh, given, the, given the audience. If there's any place that needs innovation, it's public administration. Uh, boy, oh boy, could we use a, a healthy dose uh, of, of that. I'm really glad uh, to be with you tonight. Uh, I'm just really an innovation junkie. I, I you know, eat, breathe, and sleep this stuff. I'm, and I think a lot of you would probably you know, share this notion that no matter what situation we see, we're always thinking about and trying to do it better. Always. There's always a better way. And uh, I've often uh, said that it's a blessing and a curse. You know, because no matter what you do, you think there's a better way to do it, ranging from little stuff like driving from my office here uh, to get here you know, just a few minutes ago, it seems to me that I ought to have the information about the traffic and the construction and you know, all the stuff that could influence how I got here. It seems doable and frustrates me you know, that I don't to have it. You know, to larger, more important things like uh, when the ambulance uh, shows up uh, you know, at my grandmother's house and takes her to the hospital, you would think there would be a flow of information so that uh, she would be better prepared to be treated when she got there. Uh, or you know, you, you know, even larger societal things, um, you know, I often talk about education. You know, it makes me cry to drive by uh, our public school system. Uh, how we let it uh, get to where it is, uh, I have no idea, but it actually makes me cry. We, we've got to fix these things. And the part of innovation that I want to talk with you about tonight uh, is not incremental change. We are very good at tweaks. We know how to tweak stuff. We know how to take what we've got and make it a little bit better. We know how to take the way the current organizations we live in you know, and make them a little bit better, add some improvement, add some new technology. We know how to do that. And I, I'm not, I don't want to suggest that that's not important work and that we shouldn't do that. But I hope you agree with me that in the 21st century, given the magnitude of the challenges that we face, that we need more than tweaks. We need to learn how to transform things. We need to learn how to reinvent things. And we don't know how to do that. We don't know how to do that for ourselves as individuals. How do we reinvent ourselves? How do we reinvent the organizations that we live in? 
how do we reinvent the communities and the social systems that we have? Because just playing at the margin, just tweaking them, isn't going to work. We're not going to fix education by playing at the margin and tweaking the way the current system works. We're not going to keep our organizations, whatever type of organization we're talking about, whether it's a company, whether it's a government agency, uh, whether it's a college, right? Just tweaking the way they currently work isn't enough. Isn't enough because the half-life of the models that we live in Right, the logic that the organizations we live in works by doesn't last as long as it used to. So the half-life, the amount it takes for half of the, of the model to erode, like uranium-235, the half-life is 700 million years. So you can understand why nuclear proliferation is such a big, big deal. Stuff just lasts a real long time. Well, business models, the way our organizations work, used to last for generations. So if this is the way the college worked, you know, this is the way it still works today, this is the way it's going to work tomorrow, and we all know what our roles are and we're all very comfortable in that. It's not true anymore, and we all know that these models are being disrupted. They're being disrupted by technology, they're being disrupted by players that are coming into the space that don't play by the same set of rules. So my simple idea is that we have to learn how to reinvent ourselves, our organizations, and our, our social systems. And I've learned over a lot of years and a lot of black and blue marks that big bang approaches to change don't often work. We don't just stop doing things the way we're doing them today and then all of a sudden start doing them in some entirely new and different way. So I believe that we have to learn how to experiment with new models and approaches while we're pedaling the bicycle today. And that's a big challenge. How do you continue to pedal the bicycle of today's model to make it work, to deliver the quarterly results, to deliver against the performance metrics at your university, your school, or to, to supply the, the services that you're trying to supply out of the government agency? I mean, a lot of well-intentioned people are pedaling awfully hard to make that work, but it's not enough. It's not enough. We need the capacity for doing experiments to try new approaches, to design, to prototype, and to test new approaches at the same time that we continue to do what we're doing today. We need to be more experimental. We need to try more stuff. And we don't like to do that. We don't typically carve out the resources and the capacity to experiment and to try new things. We try new things that make the current model or approach a little bit better. We're good at the tweaks. We're terrible at trying new approaches that represent entirely new ways to make something happen. And that's what we need to get much, much better at. There's a lot of examples of this going on, and I'll, I'll share one that I really like. Uh, I often talk about blockbusters and Netflix, which is an example everybody usually you know, kind of you know, resonates uh, with, with folks. I mean, some of you aren't old enough to, you know, to remember when we used to use VCRs, but there was a time, trust me, you know, there was a time uh, when you know, we used to watch movies on VCRs. Right? And that didn't happen overnight either. The technology was there and it was invented, but it didn't go out into the marketplace right away because there was vested interest, the movie industry, that tried to lean against it. They tried to say that the VCR was ravaging the American public, ravaging the American public. Jack Valenti, who was the head of the Motion Picture Association at the time, actually testified in front of Congress that VCRs were like the Boston Strangler, you know, attacking women you know, in their homes. That's how, that's how damaging this contraption called the VCR was. What were they doing? They were trying to protect the way the movie industry worked. They didn't want us having a machine in our house that we could use to watch movies. But the case went all the way to the Supreme Court. Ultimately, the, the movie industry lost, and lo and behold, we got to have this new technology in our homes. Well, blockbusters happened about a year uh, after that, and then exploded like crazy, where every corner you could go, go get 
a video cassette of the movie you wanted, bring it home, and it grew like gangbusters. There were like 5,000 of these blockbuster <coughs> units all over the place. Now, at the same time that the video cassette technology and VCRs were happening, right next to that, what the same thing was happening in the music industry with the invention of the CD. And music was starting to be put on the CD. So it was only a matter of time until the technology enabled us to have movies on a DVD instead of a video cassette. So what did black blockbusters do? Like most organizations, they peddled the bicycle of their current model, which was to keep building these stores where we could go rent video cassettes. When, when, we, when someone said to them, what are you going to do about DVDs? They said, well, it'll just be another product on the shelf you know, at our store. And they kept building all these stores. Until one day, a guy by the name of Reed Hastings right, got pissed off because he paid a late fee for watching the movie Apollo 13. True story. Right? He got ticked off. Right? They were charging the late fee because he kept it for two more days, and that probably happened to everybody in this room. In fact, Blockbuster made $500 million off of late fees for these video cassettes. So Reed Hastings said, screw that. Right? I'm going to start a business, and he called it Netflix. He called it Netflix. And he said, hey, I can take this DVD. I don't need all the bricks and mortar of all those stores, and I can just send you that DVD in the mail. He created a new business model. Now, why didn't blockbusters think of that? Do you think they didn't see that coming? You think they didn't see the DVD coming? You think they weren't smart enough to know that maybe they could mail DVDs and not need all those stores? They knew it was coming. They knew it was happening. They couldn't get out of their existing model. And someone else came in and created a new model. Right. So what happened ultimately was blockbusters went from, you know, from they went to 5,000 stores, and they went bankrupt, right? They went bankrupt. The guy who originally did it, Wayne Hosienga, he made $8.4 billion on the way up and got out. Smart guy. He, he got out the year before the DVD was invented. Smart, very smart guy. But Viacom bought it, and they ended up taking it nowhere. They didn't change the business model, and they went bankrupt. Why do I share that story with you? Right? It used to be that you could pedal the bicycle of the same model forever. And all you had to do was keep getting better and better and better at it, and bigger and bigger and bigger. Well, that's not true anymore. We're all in danger of being Netflixed. And I think it should be a verb, Netflix. Because that's what happens when you get disrupted. When you're so used to the way things work, and you're, so, you're always trying to protect that from being disrupted, in today's environment, you're going to be Netflix. In fact, I think most of you know the story, that, the, the rest of that story, where Netflix itself is in danger of being Netflix because here comes the next technology where we can get movies online. And Netflix itself is trying to figure out what that business model is. And if you followed it closely, they went through all kinds of contortions. You know, they, 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 made a, they tried to split it into two offerings, and they tried to split it into another company. And then they came back and said, I'm sorry. But they can't figure out what their business model is, and they lost a ton of business in it. And we'll see in the end whether Netflix is able to survive the point of this story is we're all in danger of being Netflix. And if you're not experimenting with the next model while you're pedaling the bicycle today, you're not going to last that much longer. Because in, in the 21st century, these technologies are coming fast and furious. So if you're a college, right, and you're not experimenting with new learning environments and blended learning and ways to use technology you know, to, get, you know, to get access to new learning assets and teaching assets, you're going to get blindsided. You just are. It's already starting to happen. Now, you can try to prevent it. You can try to lean against it. You can try to pass laws that will slow it down. You can do all those things, which is what companies do to protect themselves. But in the 21st century, it's not going to work. What you have to do is you have to learn how to experiment with new models. Not just improvements to the current model, but entire new models. So I'll, I'll complete my comments by just briefly talking about the work that we do. So I first got really interested in this. I'd always been interested in it uh, early in my career 
uh, which was always in the private sector. So I have every black and blue mark you can imagine from uh, working with companies around the world as a consultant, uh, trying to bang executives' heads together you know, to get them to move towards a transformational change in their business model. I've always looked at it through the lens of a corporation. I had the opportunity to retire from the consulting firm, and I was living here in Rhode Island. Now, while I was traveling around the world as a road warrior consultant, I didn't spend much time focused on our local community. I, when I came home, I was with my family, I paid attention to my kids, but I wasn't reading the local newspaper, I wasn't really plugged into the community. So I found myself back home after 25 years out on the road every, every week, and my wife wasn't that interested in having me advise on household operations. She was not in the market uh, for a strategy consultant, so she was encouraging me, let's say, quote unquote, encouraging me to find something else to do. Uh, and I wanted to stay local, so for the very first time, I started paying attention to the local community, and I made the mistake of raising my hand to our previous governor uh, and uh, the then executive director of our economic development agency. And the next thing I knew, I was an accidental bureaucrat uh, working at EDC and then ultimately asked by Governor Carcieri to run the EDC. So for a guy who never paid any attention to the local community or to the public sector, frankly, here I was thinking about the public sector for the very first time in my career. I spent about six years doing it. It was an amazing, amazing six years for an, any number of reasons. One, because Rhode Island is an interesting, quirky place. I love it. It has incredible potential. Sometimes we can't get out of our own way. I'm sure in the Q&A maybe we can talk you know, a little bit more about some of the local uh, community things. Uh, I also love it because it's small and accessible and for an innovation junkie like me, it feels like an innovation platform. It feels like a real world laboratory. Hypothetically, we should be better here in Rhode Island because we're small and everybody knows each other and all the institutions should be able to connect with each other. We should be out in front in transforming all of these systems. We should be leading the country and be an example for the world in education, in healthcare, in energy, in entrepreneurship because these are all systems challenges that are only going to get better if we learn how to experiment at the systems level. If we do more than tweaking and we learn how to do transformational things. And because we have such a small, compact, accessible ecosystem, it looked to me like a platform that could be an innovation hotspot. That would be good not only for us as citizens who live here, but it would be good economically because people would think about and look at the state differently and be more interested in investing in it as an innovation platform. We're never going to win if we try to play the same game everyone else plays. We're too small. So trying to play the community game, try to play the game like everyone else plays it, we will lose all the time because we don't have enough scale to play it that same way. If you flip that on its head and say because we're small, we have the small world properties necessary to get more quickly from concept to prototype to testing to scaling new ideas, we could be out in front. Try to do that in Boston, LA, or New York. They can't even figure out who the other people are. We all know each other. We have a really important competitive advantage. We don't use it enough, and there's a lot more that we need to do. So my perspective on innovation changed incredibly when I became an accidental bureaucrat, because now for the first time, I was thinking about innovation through the lens of the community not through the lens of a, a single organization. And it became very, very clear to me that innovation means changing some of the social systems that we have, and those social systems have both a public and a private sector component. You can take any one of them, education, healthcare, energy, there's a public sector component to that and role, there's a private sector component and role. They all work in the existing system that has evolved over a long period of time, but it was designed for the industrial era. It's well-intentioned, don't get me wrong. People are working hard in it. I'm not critical of it. I understand it. People are pedaling the bicycle as hard as they can to try to do the right thing. The problem is not that they're not pedaling the bicycle hard enough. 
The problem is that we need to transform the systems, and we're not going to transform the systems by playing around at the margin. We have to carve out the space in the real world where we can prototype and test different approaches, different ways to use technology, not to sustain the current system, but to enable the new system. Even when the new system is disruptive, is, net, is a Netflixer of the current system, and that's the hardest part, because we all have a vested interest in the way it works today, and we're, we're all comfortable you know, in the way it works today. The problem with that is students suffer because our education system you know, isn't what it needs to be, patients suffer because our healthcare system isn't what it needs to be. As citizens, we don't have the right mix of energy platforms and sources that we need for the 21st century. So the work that, that I do now uh, leading the Business Innovation Factory is a community of innovators from around the country and around the world that recognize that we need to transform these social systems. We recognize that we don't have all the answers, but we know we need to go up that learning curve and we're trying to form a community and create the platform and tools necessary to take ideas off of the whiteboard, put them onto the real world test bed so that we can explore new and better ways to deliver value to our citizens, students, you know, patients uh, in these uh, social systems. So I think I'll, 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 I'll stop there uh, as just uh, an overview of the concept, and I'm happy to explore uh, any part of that or any area uh, that you're particularly interested in. We have some this evening people from my grant classes, from public policy, okay. uh, for you from the methods class, and I know in grant thinking, coming up with new ideas, right? I'm yes, going to, Dr. O, we are. I'm also okay. going to pass around a couple of handouts. Ms. Zenos has a question. Uh, Mr. Kaplan, my, your comment about the school system yep. kind of resonated with me. My sister and her husband were um, very ground level involved with setting up a new charter school because they were unhappy with the current state of their school systems in their home area. And um, my question is, as far as instituting change, if you've got a thoroughly entrenched organization, yep. um, is, is, in your yep. honest opinion, is it possible yep. to change the system, or is it easier just to start from scratch? Yeah, so it's a good question. Um, a couple of thoughts I'll share with you, and if you haven't uh, met and or know of the work of the Dennis, who I introduced earlier, uh, the work that they do at the Med School and the Big Picture Company, uh, is an example of starting from scratch. So what Dennis did is he said, he said, we can't get there from here within the current system. You know, our philosophy is, is experiential learning, one student at a time, and we need to design, uh, uh, we need to design around that principle and around the student. And they've done it, and they, they did it here in Rhode Island, you know, with the Met School uh, here in Providence down in Newport, and they've done it now nationally. I'm on the board of the Big Picture Company, so it's a great example. Of, of how you can start from scratch to redesign around the end user, in this case, the student. One other comment I would make on this, I, I have a theory uh, that I call the connected adjacency, which says if you want to create systems change, it, one way to do it is, is to try to create a standalone, I'm just going to go off and do it, ignore everybody else, and then I'm going to try to influence back with what happens in the system. I wonder if there's not a model that, that I call connected adjacency, or more simply said, a sandbox next to the current system, right? So keep running the current school, school system, state, but where can you create the sandbox that's got some connectivity back, right? So it's not isolated like many charter schools are, but it's connected to the system. But it has the freedom and autonomy and the resources to be able to design, prototype, and test new student-centered approaches. It can borrow capabilities from the existing system, but it can reconfigure them right, in new and different ways, which is what we really need to do. Now, this is easier to say than it is to do. It requires leadership that gets that we need to experiment. Right? So I spent a lot of time when I was in state government here proselytizing, trying to convince people that they, damn it, you should innovate, right? and get really frustrated when they wouldn't. I've come to learn that I mean, some people just aren't going to innovate. They're, you know, they're either they're so vested in the way it works today that they're going to lean against any change, no matter what you do, 
or they're just not comfortable playing in an environment that's experimental, they don't want to take the risk. I've also found many people who want to take managed risks, who want to experiment and try new things. What we do is we find those people. So I'm not trying to convert people that don't get it or don't want to change. I'm trying to find people who do get it, want to experiment and change, and help connect them to others that do and provide the resources and platforms for the change to happen. So shorter answer would have been, there are some situations where I don't think you can get there from here, and there are others where I think there's pockets of people and some leadership that knows they need to change, they want to be positioned as the ones that are out in front, and we have to help them move much faster than we're, than we're doing it today. You're welcome. Yeah, can we can. Um. I, from what I've gotten from this, it's basically the systems that we have now, it's like a rundown car. We need to strip it in order for it to start over. And from what I understand, it really it gets easier to take what we have existing and just strip it down to the cores, the what it should be, like the very uh, heart of it. And so that way people who aren't quite comfortable with it can still see that the what they need for that kind of structure is still there so they can help like transition and then you can just build from there. Yeah, it's great. It's a great observation. The, um, and I love the analogy of the, of, of the car. I often talk about uh, if, uh, if, if a car has uh, six cylinders in it, most organizations are lucky if they run on four or five cylinders. Now, the, the, the president will tell you they run on six, but it's just not true. I mean, no, nobody runs on six. But m many government organizations run on three or four, and that's part of the problem we have. Not because people aren't working hard, but there's just so many constraints on the way we do our work that it's almost impossible to experiment and change. The, the answer to your question is that, yes, what we need to do is be able to reconfigure the parts. I don't necessarily need to invent anything new to transform education. It's not about invention. We confuse invention and innovation. In fact, we conflate them, right? Invention is, is exciting, and I'm glad we're a country that celebrates it. We need to invent new stuff. I'm glad we do that. But we think that's innovation. Innovation is a better way to deliver value or fix the problem. Many times, innovation only requires taking what I already have and being able to reassemble the parts in a different way to try a different configuration of the parts. The problem is that in our current organizations, we don't get the freedom to do it. We don't get the freedom to play. Like, what if I took that capability and this capability and added this technology and put the student at the center instead? You know, maybe I could do it completely differently. I didn't invent anything new. What I need is the sandbox. So what I need to do is, as you suggest, I need that connected adjacency, that sandbox, and the ability to reach into the current model and say, can I borrow these capabilities? I'm going to play with them in a different way than you're using them over here. And I'm going to show you that I can deliver better value for the same or less money than the way you're doing it over here today. The trick is, how do you get people to let you do that? How do you let people <laughs> allow you to create the sandbox and to have true autonomy and flexibility? Because what happens is, the minute if I'm running this core business over here, and I see you over here beginning to play with a Netflix that's going to affect my current business, I'm like, don't do that. You know, you're going to affect my current business. Well, my answer is, yeah, I'm going to affect your current business. If I don't, someone else is. So why not do it ourselves? Why not figure out what the next model is and be out in front? You know, she uses that analogy. You came up with the electric car. Yeah. So that's a good example yeah. of using them. I love it. Them. I just, um, you, you guys were actually the, the guinea pigs. I just, um, I just, I spent the last year uh, writing a book, which is something I never thought I would do, uh, but a uh, publisher called and asked me to do it and gave me an advance and uh, created a deadline, and so I agreed to do it. I literally just sent it off uh, to print last week, and in it, I used the example of a company called Better Place. I don't know if you're familiar with it. Uh, that you should look for it if you're interested in the electric car thing. So Better Place, uh, run by this really cool guy, Shea Agassi, uh, is trying to create an environment where we can move to all electric cars. 
And it's a great example of what we've been talking about tonight because we could, we could be all electric cars today. The technology is there for us to do it. It's yeah. never the technology that gets in the way. It's humans and the organizations and vested interests that get in the way of doing it. So he has literally created a company that builds a system for electric cars, not just the car, the battery, but how we're going to swap the batteries out so that we can drive longer distance with the cars, right? How we're going to maintain the cars and the battery. He created a whole ecosystem around it, and then he found, just look to my example before about what Rhode Island should do, he went out, he went to Israel, and, and, he, and he went to Denmark, and he said, and he went to Hawaii. He said, you guys are small places where we could demonstrate this system. It's small, compact, right? It'd take a while. I mean, it'd be easy to do, right? And so how do we create a system that we can stand up in the real world to demonstrate to the rest of the world that we can all be on electric cars? And that's exactly what he's doing. Look, look it up better. It's called Better Place. It's a perfect example of what systems change is about and how we need to find real world environments to design and stand up new systems and then shine a big spotlight on them and say, you see, we could be all electric cars. We just have to move faster to make this systems change. Great, Doug. Um, uh, just thinking about like, a comparison between the private and public sectors. Yep. I mean, you, know, you kind of talked about this, but the biggest thing that sticks out is uh, what are the outcomes, you know, for, for, for uh, Blockbuster, the outcome was sales. Yep. Um, but in education, for instance, yep. like the outcome is uh, student outcomes. Yep. Um, and so it's harder to experiment and have that sandbox when um, student outcomes are at risk or you can face um, Why? a change. Well, because, it, you know, it's our children's uh, educational uh, outcome that, you know, we're experimenting with. But um, I, I think it is possible. I mean, we look to research-based and scientifically-based models, and we're able to pull pieces from those, see what, see what works. But um, I... Um, I wanted to see what you thought about uh, yeah. the current state of education in Rhode Island. And uh, I know there's been a lot of innovative changes lately, yeah. um, and new, te new requirements for teachers, new evaluation systems, new graduation requirements and such. And um, if you think Rhode Island may be moving towards uh, more innovative Yep. So, so, so two thoughts. I'm a little bit of a heretic on the first part of your question. Uh, so, you know, so excuse me for it. But I, I actually believe that it's the adults that are getting in the way, right? If we would actually ask students, it's amazing what students will tell you. And this is true at every level, college level too. I mean, it's amazing to me when I go to meetings to talk about reimagining the future of a college or of a school, and there's no students in the room. And I'm like, this is wrong. I mean, with the, the, we should have students here, and the adults should be sitting around the edges of the room, and we should have students designing the future that they're going to be more engaged in. And when you do that, when you do that, you will be amazed at how students step up to that challenge. And if you give them the tools to do it, and you show them that you mean it, why don't we have the customer actually design their own future? Now, I think one of the good things about the century we're in, and we're early, is I believe that we're just now starting to realize the power of self-organization. We grew up, guys like me, dinosaurs like me, that grew up in the industrial era, we were so dependent on the institutions around us. Our, our whole worth was wrapped up in institutions for jobs. Like, this is where our stature came from. This is where our credentials came from. This is, I, mean, I have three kids, and I'm not so sure they're as wrapped up in all these institutions the way I was. They're going to design it themselves. You know, and God bless them, and any institution that tries to get in their way, and multiply that times a lot of you that's empowered today, communicating in a different way. It makes me very optimistic about the future. I think it's the adults that are getting in the way. We ought to put the end user, whether it's the patient in the or the student in education, in the driver's seat and enable them to, to participate in the design of the future we want because they're going to be a lot more engaged in it. Your specific question about, about Rhode Island, uh, I think it's a mixed bag. I'm, um, I'm encouraged. Um, I personally, this is my own personal uh, point of view, I'm a big fan of Commissioner Gist. 
Uh, I think she, her heart's in the right place. I think she wants to push the envelope, uh, and I think uh, she's an important asset here in Rhode Island, my own uh, personal uh, point of view. I think there are things that she's been successful at, some things that she's been blocked and had more difficulty uh, with, which is to be expected. To me, our education system here in Rhode Island is the number one thing that we have to transform if we're going to transform the economy. Because if you don't transform that, and you don't create the flow of the 21st century workforce, you are destined to have you know, the remnants of a lower wage service economy that, you know, and we've got to get out of that trap. So to me, education is the most important thing uh, that we can do. Sal, I just want to respond to your question. Um, we've been a very successful school. The Met talked about it being a very innovative school. We have 100 around the country and internationally. But we know that we have to keep changing. And so last week, we took three kids from every one of our six schools. We brought them together at Sal's place to get them out of the school and said, how would you redesign the school? And they spent three days trying to think what's really important, what, we, what can we lose? Then next Thursday and Friday, we're closing school and the teachers are going to do it, but the kids are presenting to the teachers on what they thought. So it's starting with the client going to teachers. It's not me sitting back and thinking this is a cool idea. So it's that kind of process that you have to do to get the buy-in and really make the change. Wendy, go ahead. Yes, um, when you began working for the Rolani, sorry, sorry, when you began working for the Rolani, you see, you, you mentioned the fact that you recognize the need for innovation. You experienced resistance from those who were already employed there. How did you deal with that? Um, Can you repeat the question, yeah, Sam? Yeah, if I, if, I, if, I, if, I, if I understand the question you're asking, you know, well, I was in state government, you know, where the resistance come from? <coughs> So, um, I, you know, I, I'm not negative. I, again, I go back to people that are working awfully hard. But what I came to understand is that, that there are, aren't a lot of people that are really change agents that really recognize that, that tweaks are enough. I mean, you still have a lot of people who think that either one, the old economy is coming back, or two, that we can tweak our way in. I personally don't believe that. I think we need a transformational change. I think that's what it's going to take. And in order to do that, it's going to take leadership and a lot of stakeholders that want to change it. The, the encouraging thing for me is that, uh, to my previous answer, about uh, not relying on the institutions to do it. I've also come to the conclusion that if we wait for the large institutions to, to, manage, to lead and manage a transformational change, we're going to be waiting a very, very long time. So I think it's up to us, the citizens, right, to to be more connected, to be more organized, to, to be more passionate about what we want our community to be and figure out how well, we can transfer some of this network power into more purpose. I think you're seeing the early days of that. You know, when you see the Occupy movement and some of these other movements, it's still early days. You know, what you see are people that are connecting together, sharing information. You see a lot of passion in those kinds of conversations. What I'm not sure I see enough of yet is the, per the, co the what I call purposeful networks. You know, harnessing that for clear purpose to lever change so that the institutions that are public and private, so the institutions understand that we need it. And this is the kind of community we want, this is the kind of change that we want, and continually <coughs> exert pressure on institutional leaders to take us there. I believe that you're gonna, over the next, you know, you, you, know, you put your time frame on it, but I don't think, I mean, I think it's a 10, 15 year kind of thing, but you're gonna see, you know, like the next rev of Occupy is going to be far more purposeful. Like if you saw the, the anti soap <coughs> thing, if you followed that online, you saw what happened when people just out of the blue just started to connect and with c very clear purpose about what they were trying to stop, which was this piece of legislation that was going to affect um, you know, in, in the role that some of these internet companies were going to have to play uh, and our role on the internet. It was immediate and it was effective. And if you're sitting there and you're one of the traditional institutions and you watch that, you ought to be awfully scared. 
because that if last time you're going to start to see that kind of work, you know, network become incredibly purposeful, be very pointed, and be used as a lever to move institu institutions uh, forward. Uh, it's an exciting time for that. I mean, I'm glad to be some small part of it. It was very cool. I work in, in state service. I've worked in state service for a lot of years. And um, it seems from my perspective, and I don't know if you would agree, that sometimes the resistance seen as overall resistance is really pockets of um, disagreement in terms of um, some proposals to change from public service into the private sector yep. are replicating the public model in the private right. sector. And, and some people who have seen that not work are resistant to it, not because it's going private, but because it's a replication of what didn't work. Yep. Sometimes I, I, I often thought that, I, there's two things I would share with you. One, one, I often thought that we needed a new set of tables. Not to replace the old set. There's a role for public discourse. There's a role for being able to, 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 to represent your institution's views, you know, to make sure that legislation reflects you know, your interests. I think that's very healthy. I, I, I wouldn't change any of that. The problem is that the people that are at those tables are not there to transform anything. That's not why they're at those tables, right? And so I mean, if you're a change agent and you're sitting at those tables, you're with the wrong folks. Those folks are at the table to represent their institution's interests and to make sure that the system is sustained and that their institution remains competitive and that they improve their competitive position within the system. Nothing wrong with that. We need another set of tables over here that we're not having that conversation. I don't care. Uh, my, my goal is to where do we find the conditions for experimentation? What, where can we begin to take ideas, get them off of the whiteboard, get them onto the ground, and start to demonstrate that we can move some of these models in a new direction? And the people that you want at those tables right, are not the people that are lobbying to keep the system the way it is. You want people at those tables that are ready to try some new things and have access to the resources that, that can help you do it. The other thing I would add quickly here you know, that I didn't say earlier, I, I'm a very strong believer in the, this notion of horizontal thinking and acting. We are too siloed. We are way too siloed uh, as individuals, as organizations, you know, and as a community. Right? I used to, when I worked in government, you know, I would on Monday meet with the healthcare crowd, on Tuesday was the education crowd, on Wednesday was the marine science crowd, Thursday was the art. I mean, and you, you, know, you get the picture, right? And everybody in those rooms were, were advocating for their silo. And all I ever wanted to do was find the innovators in each of those rooms and get them out of those conversations and connect them horizontally. Right, to get them to start thinking about community problems outside of their silos. Because until we can think and act more horizontally, we're not going to change any of these systems. So I have this, uh, this, this notion I call random collisions of unusual suspects. I think the way you learn and the way you get better is by getting out of your comfort zone, by getting out of your silo, by putting yourself in a position where you collide with unusual suspects, people that don't share your view, people that work in a completely different you know, area than you work in, someone who can teach you something, right? When, when, who do we hang out with? The same people all the time. It was the same people in those meeting rooms every single time, right? They weren't going to do anything new. They all knew their ideas. They, I mean, everybody knew their positions already. Right? I think you've got to get yourself into a room with, with people you didn't know, with disciplines that you're not comfortable with, that you don't know anything about, and get yourself into the gray area between them, because that's where the gold is. The gold is in the gray area between the silos. They're not, the gold isn't in the silos. And so you've got to figure out how you can make it, make it more horizontal. That's true for individuals that want to get better faster and to learn. That's true for organizations that want to get exposed to different ideas that could actually help them change their model. And that's true for communities. If you really want to strengthen the community, break down the silo. Literally, find ways to convene people that aren't usually together. 
create conversations amongst people that don't normally talk with one another, and you will find that's where you generate new ideas and new approaches. And if you can, if you can activate that, then you can change the community, you can change the organization, and you can change the community. Uh, the woman that was running it that worked for the agency because of what she was hearing from the agency. So the five of us have banded together and we are now currently applying for our own 501c3. And um, we are asking different sponsors to be fiscal agents while we go through that application process. My question is, as we go through that process, we have no budget, we have no salary, we all have full-time jobs. This is something that we feel that is very important. Cool. How can we go about requesting grant money without a budget, without yep. any kind of salary or anything yeah. like that? Yeah, well, I mean, you have the most important thing, right? You have passion, right? And, you know, and passion is the key ingredient. Because without that, who cares about any of the rest of it? So if you start there and you're passionate about your idea, mm -hmm. then, then put your idea out there, right? Share your idea. Share it with unusual suspects. Get it out there. Social media is incredible for that. Right? You know, you know, share the idea. You're going to find other people that might be interested in the idea, other people that might point you to places you can go you know, that, to talk with people that share that passion or have a related passion, people that might know where there are pockets of resources that you can use. I mean, don't, the, the, one of the good things about the century we live in that makes, that levels the playing field is, it, it, which also scares the big institutions. I mean, it used to be if you weren't a big institution, you didn't have the resources to do any of this stuff. Now, I mean, we can do all this stuff now. We don't need a big institution. We don't need all the capabilities. I don't need an IT department. You know, I don't need a marketing department. I don't need all this stuff, right? You know, and I need a Twitter account, you know, a Facebook account, you know, and a point of view. And you put your ideas out, and if you work them hard enough, you're gonna, and, you, and you keep that passion you're talking about, you're going to you're going to find ways to resources and other people that have ideas you know that can help you um, intellectual capital is one of the greatest uh, resources for most business organizations and um, <coughs> finding a way to retain that I want to know what does your organization do to influence regional businesses public sector organizations to create programs to help retain intellectual capital intellectual yeah capital? Intellectual capital. Capital. yeah yeah, so I, I, I Some knowledge, I mean like training programs and, and yeah. uh, just to retain what, what the organization values. Yeah, so uh, I have a little bit of a, a heretic on this as well. I, don't, I suppose I should stop saying that. <laughs> I think I am on all this stuff. Um, in the industrial era, era I think we, we treated intellectual capital uh, in a way uh, that worked for the industrial era and that isn't right for this century. And we haven't figured out yet how to move out of that. And the people that are in the business of protecting their ideas and what they think and are in rigid organizations that tell you can't talk to this person and I don't want you communicating with that person and you know, you create, we, we put such straight jackets on people. No wonder, no wonder we're not improving our organizations because we've sucked the life out of the people in them. Right, because we put so many rules in there around what they can and can't say and do. It's beyond me. I mean, why wouldn't you want all the people in your organization to be your marketing department? Right, to be out talking, to be excited and passionate about what you're doing and having connections and sharing ideas and creating an open flow of ideas. And the reason we don't do it is because we're worried, we're worried that somebody's going to steal our idea. Well, I got news for a lot of people who are worried about that. Ideas. There are. T we got plenty of ideas. The ch we're not short of ideas. We're not short of intellectual capital. There's a ton of it, and we're even getting better at making connections to to share and exchange it. What we're short on is how to leverage the ideas into prototypes and experiments and to move like that. But we're short on the implementation. We're short on business models to activate the ideas, to sustain the ideas. That's where the competitive advantage is going to be. Ideas should be open, like we should open source all of that. We should be openly sharing, you know, all right. Now I know I'm a little extreme on that and there are some industries, you know, where you know I've got to be a little more protective of trade secrets and all of that, but it's way overblown. 
this, I, this idea of protecting within the, the walls of the organization. We would do much better if we just opened the walls of the organization and we would have much better and richer ideas if we had a free flow of exchange you know, coming in and out. We'd have more motivated employees if we trusted our employees to be advocating for exchanging ideas around the work that we're doing. I'm going to play Tom Ashbrook here. Our, our time is short. Mr. Slattery, you had a question? Uh, yeah, I was wondering, in your time at the, uh, um, at the EDC, did you see any examples, primarily in the public sector, of attempts at transformational changes and new models being um, uh, implemented within the public sector here in, uh, here in Rhode Island? Yeah, not many. Um, <laughs> and, and, and again, no, um, you know, given the time that I served, uh, it was, uh, it, the focus was so much on the cost side, and still is, right? We are so hunkered down in trying to get the cost side of government right that there is very, very little uh, bandwidth uh, for new stuff. And that's a, that's a shame. Right, because how do you change and serve the citizens better when all you're focused on is the cost side? Same thing would happen in a business, right? Yes, I want to get our costs in better position, right? No question about that. But Rhode Island isn't going to win by having a, a better cost position. It's a, a necessary but not sufficient. Yes, we need a better cost position. Yes, I'm glad we're getting pensions along and we're doing all the stuff that we're doing. We have to do those things. You could do all those things, and in the end, we're still going to come back to who are we as a state? How do we differentiate ourselves? What's our competitive advantage? Uh, and how do we get two things to happen? And, and, and how, how do we get the people to think differently about our environment so they'd be willing to invest in it? Time and, and money. And before we do that, how do we get our own citizens to feel good about it? Because our biggest problem here, I've said this, I've, I've said this the whole time I was in office, our biggest problem is our psychology. Our psychology is awful. I mean, we are typical New Englanders, and Rhode Island you know, is even an outlier. We are the most cynical people on the planet. Right? I know, I, I mean, I am a New Englander, right? So, but we, our cynicism is getting in the way. If you, I mean, how do you think people are going to invest in our community when you ask people in our own community and if you ask them, and then they're honest about it, they'll tell you all the stuff that's wrong about the community. It's just true. You go ahead, you know, you know it. You're in those conversations all the time. Until we start feeling better about our own community to where we would positively advocate for our own community, how could you ever expect you know, the community to strengthen its position? So it starts with us. It starts with our, our psychology. And yes, we need to get our cost position in better alignment as a state, but when are we going to start thinking about what we want to be as a community and to be able to say it confidently and positively? We had started that. A lot of the work I did was to try to create the conversation around innovation and entrepreneurship you know, and kind of start to characterize what the future economy can be. And that conversation continues today. There's a lot of great programs we started, a lot of new programs that have started. I'm encouraged by that. We have to elevate it, we have to make it more central, and we have to get more citizens to buy into it so that they're starting to positively talk about our own community and the opportunity here. Let me interrupt. I know there will be other questions, but time grows short. Um, Mr. Kaplan, thank you for your You're time. You're welcome. My pleasure. And I know that you will be able to dialogue with these folks a little bit after, after the session. And um, we can go to the website and learn more about it. Yeah, so go, uh, you know, go to businessinnovationfactory.com and you can see all the work that we're doing there. If you're on Twitter, I'm SKAP5, SCAP5. Uh, and I'm a, you know, a fool about that, so I'm, uh, I'll, I'll load up your Twitter stream if you're crazy enough to follow me. Uh, and any other way you want to connect, I'm happy to continue the conversation. Excellent, thank you. And uh, we really appreciate your time. bit of a token of our appreciation oh, for you. Thank you very much. Um, this is a gift that comes from a Rhode Island factory. It's great. Owned by a Rhode Island resident. Wow. Made with Rhode Island materials. 
Rhode Island. Can you do some words, Charlie? No, it's not. Thank you. Now, I knew I was going, going to forget you know, someone earlier in uh, my thank yous, and Mary McKee was on the, on the Rhode Island uh, ASPA Council and came to a number of meetings to get this work done. And our IT people, um, Ryan Hall, Dean uh, Ken Osborne, and uh, Russell Boschman, who was here earlier, who will be joining us in class uh, remotely. So, Mr. Kaplan, again, many, many thanks. And uh, we look forward to perhaps having you back. And you were certainly invited to our May 1 event um, on, the, on the Bristol campus, actually, of course. Um, one other thank you, Ed Pascarella, who's key to grants and PA Academy. So, pardon the extreme of consciousness, though. All right, thank you again, Mr. Kaplan, and uh, I will see my uh, PA 503, LAAD 503. Uh, <laughs> <downstairs>. <laughs>